Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. Zeit begrüßt. Ich heiße Vivian Felsen <coughs> und es ist mein größtes Covid, euch zu begrüßen in Namen von dem UJA Komitee für Jiddisch. Entschuldigt. <coughs> der, von dem UJA Komitee für Jiddisch bei der Toronto Jiddische Föderation. My name is Vivian Felsen, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event on behalf of Toronto's UJA Committee for Yiddish, especially because this is the first time since we are co-presenting a program with the Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University. Before I tell you about our two speakers, Professor Josh Vogel and Professor Kalman Weiser, I would like to say a few words about our committee. The Committee for Yiddish was created in the early 1960s under the auspices of the Canadian Jewish Congress to foster and promote Yiddish cultural activity in Toronto. To this day, the Committee for Yiddish continues to pursue its goals by organizing lectures and programs, by offering our own Yiddish classes at all levels, and by supporting a variety of other events in the community such as concert and film. For more information, please visit our website at committeeforyiddish.com. Kalman Weiser is the Silber Family Professor of Modern Jewish Studies at York University in Toronto. His books include key concepts in the study of anti-Semitism, the expanded edition of Solomon Birnbaum's Yiddish, a survey and grammar, and Jewish people, Yiddish nation, Noah Prilutsky and the focus in Poland. He has, all, he has recently completed the manuscript for a book about Yiddish scholars, Max Weinreich and Solomon Birnbaum and their relationship with each other and with German colleagues who served the Third Reich. Presently, he is conducting work on the history of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in post-war America. He is a popular speaker in both Yiddish and English on topics relating to modern Jewish history, culture, and language. I've known Kalman ever since he first arrived in Toronto, and I've had the opportunity to introduce him as a guest speaker on several occasions. However, this is my first time introducing Joshua Vogel. In 2014, Josh Vogel began translating the nine volumes, 7,100 biographies in the lexicon von der Naya Yiddische Literatur, in English known as the Biographical Dictionary of Modern Yiddish Literature. As a translator of Yiddish, I've been aware of his ongoing translation of the lexicon for many years. I knew he was a professor at York, but what I did not realize was that his day job is as a sinologist who specializes in the history of modern China, especially on the cultural and political relations between China and Japan. Since 2005, he has held the Tier 1 Canada Research Chair at York University. It is now my privilege to present Josh Vogel in conversation with Kalman Weiser. Thank you so much, Vivian. Uh, I'm going to say a few words before we begin. So Josh, please hold on. Josh is the star of today's show, but I have a few things to say first, and I'm going to read them. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today, and I want to speak on behalf of the Kashitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York, whose director I am this year, although I'm on sabbatical. The Kashitsky Center is not only an interdisciplinary research center specializing in the Canadian and modern Jewish experiences, it also offers a wide range of academic, literary, musical, and cultural events throughout the year, both online and in person, to which we invite you. Now, as a Yiddish scholar and historian, I think you know this about me already, I take special pleasure in today's event, which draws on the wealth of individuals engaged in the field of Yiddish here in Toronto. Toronto occupies an important but generally underrecognized role in the history of Yiddish scholarship and culture. 
As Vivian mentioned, I'm working on the history of the Yibo Institute in New York City after World War II. Now, in my research, among other things, what I've been really impressed by is how much Canadian jewelry, including Toronto jewelry, has supported the Institute throughout the decades with money, archival materials, folklore, and rare publications. I'm also duly impressed by the number of outstanding scholars, among them Michael Herzog, Barbara kirschenblatt Gimblet, that Toronto has contributed to Yiddish studies throughout the years. And of course, let us not forget that Toronto became home to Solomon Birnbaum, one of the most important Yiddish scholars of the 20th century in his later years. So Toronto has much to be proud about, proud of, and there is much history about Yiddish culture in Toronto that remains to be written. Now, as Vivian mentioned, this is the Kashitsky Center's first collaboration with Toronto's Committee for Yiddish, but we already have more in store. So I'd like to bring your attention to a few events. Far off in May, we will be hosting the rediscovery of Yiddish women writers, Frida Foreman in conversation with Vivian Felsen. Frida and Vivian, both of whom are located here in Toronto, will be discussing their roles in the rediscovery, translation, and publication of Yiddish women's writing, as well as their efforts on behalf of the future of Yiddish. But I'd also like to bring your attention to a few events that are coming sooner. And these are all events specifically that have a relationship about Yiddish culture. If you want to find out more about these events, as well as all of our, our, our other events, please sign up for our mailing list or visit the center's website. So firstly, I'd like to tell you about the Amos Hoffman and Noam Lemish Quartet, which will present jazz arrangements of melodies from Jewish communities in the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Europe on February 16th. That's a live event on campus. On March 19th at 7 p.m., the Koshitsky Center will host online the annual Leonard Walensky Lectures in Jewish Life and Education. This year's topic is the making and unmaking of Russian Jewelry, which of course is a very important theme for today's days. Uh, the participants will be Professors Jeffrey Weidlinger, Sasha Sendorovich, and Toronto's own Anna Stanchis. I should mention, of course, that Jeffrey Weidlinger is also a Toronto native. Finally, York's Kashitsky Center will be a proud co-sponsor of the conference Beis Yankif, or Beis Yaakov, in historical and transnational perspective, to be held at the University of Toronto's and Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies on March 20th to 21st. So as I said, please sign up for our mailing list for further details about these events, or check out our website. Now, before I welcome today's main speaker, Professor Josh Fogel, I'd very likely, very briefly like to tell you how we're going to run today's events. First, Josh is going to speak about his experience with the lexicon. Then I'm going to engage in a dialogue interview with him about the lexicon and its reception, the reception of his project. Finally, we'll take audiences, we'll take questions from you, the audience. So if you have any questions at any time, please write them in the Q&A box. And now, without further ado, I welcome my colleague, Professor Josh Vogel. Thank you very much, Vivian. Thank you very much, Kalman. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, and it's a little odd to be speaking to an audience that I cannot see, but that's OK. Um, so let me start by telling you what the lexicon is. But first, I should say that uh, the word lexicon in English and the word lexicon in Yiddish are what the French call faux amis. They're, they don't mean the same thing necessarily. Uh, a, a lexicon in Yiddish can be like a lexicon in English. That is, all the words that appear in a text lined up and telling you where they are and so on. But in this case, it's more like a, it means more like handbook. But in this specific case of what I undertook to translate, it's the biographical dictionary. Now, biographical dictionary would never be a definition of what the English word lexicon is. So I'm just bringing that to your attention. This is an average volume. There are eight of them like this, and there's that word lexicon. Uh, there it is, like that. Um, they're each big and fat, and then columns and so on. Um, in the process of doing this, I've made lots of online friends that I've never met in person. Uh, I think that's also due to the pandemic, but it's also due to the extraordinary capacity of the internet. 
affords us, one of whom um, is the Judaica Library in, at Ohio State University, Yossi Galron. I don't know if Yossi is online, but if he is, let me thank you verbally um, enormously. He's a huge help. And these librarians nowadays are the most amazing people online. And he introduced me to the fact that there is, this is eight volumes long, but there is a ninth volume, he said, and it's online too. And he sent it to me, just, and it's you know fully as long as, as one of these guys. And it includes emendations, corrections, and additions, people that didn't get in. I will talk about that in just a second. Um, you have to understand something which dawned on me fairly early in the project, that when this started in the 1950s, and it, it took until the early 1980s before they completed all eight volumes, nine volumes eventually, these were the greatest Yiddish um, writers alive at the time. Uh, most of them, not all of them, of course. But they, these people, for, for them for, to read Yiddish was, was like the way that most of us read our first language. There, there aren't many people left in the world for whom Yiddish is genuinely a first and um, primary language. But for them, it was. It's an enormous undertaking just to line up the 7,000 plus people that you want to write biographies of and then to assign many of them to people. It's a, it's a group of about eight or 10 men, almost all men. And it changed because a number of them died over the course of the um, roughly 30 years that it took to bring this to conclusion. Um, every single one of the people that are in the original eight and uh, are, are no longer with us, with, with, one, or, with one or two exceptions. Um, it, it's... Uh, Oh, and then there is a 10th volume, you know, as, is, as the ads would say, but wait, there's more. And this volume came out later, and it came out considerably later, and it is of Yiddish writers in the Soviet Union. Um, and it includes emendations, again, because it came out later, of those Yiddish Soviet writers in the original volume, original eight or nine volumes, uh, corrections and so on. But then it also includes quite a few new people, new to the lexicon, that is, uh, who were entirely um, uh, missed for one reason. And that includes a lot of women writers for one um, and, and so on. Um, why would anybody want to do, uh, to translate something like this, you might say, why would, I, and, and, and produce it in this way that is post the biographies online? Well, before I say that, I should say that these biographies range in, in length from a couple of sentences, a short paragraph, to, to very long ones on the most famous Yiddish writers, which, if published in English translation, could fill a, you know, a, a small booklet uh, or maybe a lengthy pamphlet. So there are a wide range of these. Um, some of them are signed, some of them are not signed. Um, that is the author of the, of the entry. Some of them have lengthy bibliographical information. Um, some do not. I included wherever I could find them online pictures of the individual. In fact, I included one or two pictures that were not of the right individual. And that was, and I'll talk about this in a second. People wrote in to me and said, I don't think that's the right one. And then I would change it. That's one of the great things about publishing online. Um, I have had, I would just check before we came online today. And I've had just short of 800,000 um, uh, hits, individual hits on this site. You know, it, in 10 lifetimes, I couldn't get 800,000 people to lift all my other writings, all, even off a shelf, only to put it right back. It's an amazing thing. You can click on these things and, 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 then, and read it and then disappear. And no one knows or cares except me. And it's, um, it's, it's a stunning thing. But the other thing is that because the nature of the beast, there are lots of little errors, some that I introduced, but many that are in the original where you have birth and particularly death dates. Uh, I'll talk about one of those in particular in a second. Um, and all kinds of other things that you, you just, uh, and you can correct these online. And it's there always, and it can be, it's you know available to college students, nobody, you, I could never, I mean, believe me, I've spent a lot of time approaching editors with translations and saying, hey, would you like to publish this? And the constant answer that I get until I come back with a rebuttal is, 
wouldn't everybody in the field be able to read that in there because they all use that language? And the answer is they might, but they probably wouldn't. Um, and when it's available and it's free and it's there to anybody who can plug their computer in and get an internet connection, that just makes it that much easier. Um, I'm a big fan of open access too, obviously. So now why would I choose to translate it? Well, we can get into why I would choose to translate anything from Yiddish, but um, I have a very, um, well, how shall I put this? A very um, sane perception of my own capacities as a translator. I, I, I have translated, I just checked again, 34 books, including these 10, of course, so 24 other books from Chinese and Japanese. And, and there I have a much better what shall we say, uh, a much more um, open sense of what I can and can't do, by what I can do. In Yiddish, I have a, a, a you know, a, a, I realize that translating um, Yiddish fiction is much harder, translating fiction is much harder than nonfiction. So I was looking for things to translate from Yiddish that would be nonfiction, but would be useful, that would be interesting for me to do. And it, believe me, being introduced to 7,100 authors of whom roughly 7,000 I'd never heard of before was, was quite a wonderful thing. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it, I have translated novels from, from Japanese that are over a thousand pages long in the original, but uh, I, it, translating it, I, I, I have a hard enough time reading Yiddish novels, novels, fiction, use much more wide ranging vocabulary. They use dialect, they use registers of speech. All of these things are usually not to be found in nonfiction works. Uh, but this is, this ha to, to which I can add that this is useful for people, not only those who have studied Yiddish a bit, but those who have not studied it at all. And it pops up on the internet during a, a search on Google or one of the other uh, ways to uh, search things. And there it is, and there's a biography. It has enabled me to um, establish friendships with people all over the world whom I have never met. I'll talk about a handful of them, one of whom I have met, but I'll, I'll mention um, a few of the others in a second. Um, one of, when I first started doing this, and maybe Coleman and I can talk about this a little bit later, uh, I finished volume one, which was, uh, Olive and Base, all surnames beginning Olive and Base. And it, it was a modest length volume. It took me a while, probably took me, uh, I don't know, close to a year. Uh, not nonstop work. I, I do have a day job, as Vivian pointed out, but I did enjoy this a great deal. I finished it and I, I thought to myself, wait a minute, wait a minute. The most famous Yiddish writer of the post war period is not in there. How can that be? How can, and, and think about it, who would the most famous Yiddish writer of the post war? period B. Who was the only Yiddish native writer to win the Nobel Prize? And he's not in there. So I said, what, why is Beshevis missing? Beshevis appears in the uh, volume nine, the, um, the one that was sent to me online by uh, Yossi Galron in Ohio. Um, so I, I, can, I wrote to my good friend, who I've known for over 50 years, we were undergraduates together, Undergraduate, by the way, is the Canadian term for those of you outside of Canada for college students. Um, Zachary Baker. Zachary and I, we lived on the same floor in, from 1968 on in, in the dormitories at the University of Chicago. And Zachary wrote back and Zach told me that Bashevis refused to have himself included because some of the funding for this came from German reparation monies. Um, and I thought that was fascinating. That was utterly fascinating. Um, we can talk about more, but I won't say more on that right now. But when I finally did finish all eight and went back and started the new ones and found, oh, there's Beshevis. When you read that biography, and I encourage you, if you're interested in Beshevis particularly, when you read that biography of Beshevis, you will see the kind of people that wrote these biographies were completely, you know, these were people for whom Yiddish was a daytime event every day of the week and with everything they did, because it is not the same biography that you would read by someone who is not a native Yiddishist. Um, and I, I, can, I can speak more about it, but 
a lot of the books that he wrote never appeared in translation. Some of them never were published as books because they were published daily or weekly in the Yiddish press. And those are the ones that crop up in the, in the Yiddish biography that, that's translated now online, that I published online. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting um, event. We can talk more about that later if, if anyone, Colm and anyone else is, is so inclined. Um, <clears throat> um, what are the rewards of doing this? The rewards, I've, I've mentioned this uh, in the past, um, completing any project is a reward unto itself. But I think the conversations, if you will, the e-conversations that have established between, uh, that, that have been established by the presence online of these biographies has been extraordinarily re uh, rewarding. One is the variety of, oh my God, that's my Bobby. You know, <laughs> I didn't know anything about Zayde, but he did this. Yes, there's a lot of that. Uh, people who don't know Yiddish or know very little Yiddish are looking to find, you know, there's been a lot of heritage writing and family history writing going on in the world. And this enhanced people's ability to, to find out about their, their somewhat distant relatives. Uh, didn't usually go beyond one generation, didn't, was usually not less than one generation. It's usually grandparent, great grandparent. So that was very, very rewarding. Um, but I also made contact with people around the world who knew Yiddish quite well and could help me. Because let me start by saying one of the enormous difficulties of this is not the Yiddish. The Yiddish is not terribly hard. Well, establishing birthplaces for a lot of these people, because there's Jewish geography here that is not immediately obvious. If someone was born in Vilna, I know that that's Vilna. That's, you know, that's the capital of, uh, of Ashkenazic Jewry in a way. Somebody was born in Warsaw. Okay, I, I can figure that out. But there's so many shtetlich out there into which people were born, many of which don't exist anymore, some of which died out, some of which were destroyed during the war, um, some of which were incorporated into the, the neighboring cities. Um, it's a, a, a huge undertaking to figure out what these who these were, what these places were. Um, and I have a Polish friend at the University of Krakow who, who is not Jewish, but has mastered Yiddish. And he would often, and he knows, you know, Russian and Belarusian and, and uh, Ukrainian and so on, or he can figure them out much more easily than I. And he was enormously helpful in establishing where these cities were. There are a number of websites around the world that, um, that you can uh, access to help with these things. And I found some of them. There's a, if, if you type in, in your browser, falling rain, and then the name of the country, you can often find, uh, it will give, then give you many different ways to find cities, but th that's only the beginning. Um, this leads me to another point, um, which uh, also is very interesting. Of the 7,100 7, more or less biographies, I would say that fewer than five are of men and women born in Russia per se. Now, many of them, there are a couple, of course, younger ones that were born uh, either in, yeah, well, in the Soviet Union, but almost all of those of uh, these people were born in Poland, Lithuania, um, or Ukraine. Uh, and but oftentimes people we tend to glob them all together and call them Russians uh, or the Russia. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Even the ones in the Soviet volume, many of those were people who were communists who then, after the war or even uh, not after the war, before the war, after 1917, made their way um, uh, to, to, uh, to Russia and became part of uh, Soviet institutions and, and then stayed on after the war. A second person who's been extraordinarily helpful is a woman in Moscow, <clears throat> pardon me, Maria Zavorokhina. I don't know if Maria was able to get online today, but if she was, I'd, let me thank you verbally she is probably, you know how you can blog onto the end of a, a, um, an entry in, in, in online. She's added over a hundred information. She is a bibliographer um, at the State Library in Russia. And she has, has access, well, obviously because she's a native Russian speaker and a reader and has added all kinds of information about 
translations of works into Russian, out of Russian, uh, and so on with, with these Yiddish writers. So that's enormously helpful. Um, <clears throat> Most recently, I got a, a message from a, a woman who sent me probably a dozen messages over the years, uh, Miriam Gutschoff, who lives in the Netherlands. And uh, where she, she, I don't know if she reads through them all, but she has found typographical errors here, there, and whatnot. And it's been helpful because I can now go back and uh, make those corrections. As I said, that's one of the beauties of publishing online. And then in the United States, the, there are two people I wanted to thank. One I said already is Yossi Galron. He, as I say, he is Israeli originally, but has been working at Ohio State for many years. And he is himself preparing only from scratch, a lexicon of uh, Hebrew writers. Uh, but he, he was at one point preparing an index to the lexicon that I translated. Uh, anyway, he's been enormously helpful. And the other person who's also been checking me is, um, Sheva Zucker, uh, who uh, Sheva has, uh, she's retired now, but she taught in uh, uh, UNC for many years. Sheva, by the way, is Canadian from Winnipeg, but I guess that still counts. Uh, and Yossi is is uh, Israeli, although they both spent their careers in the United States. Um, I think that's pretty much all of what I wanted to stay in advance. Um, now I'm I'm glancing over some notes I put together, but yeah, I'll um. I'll I'll stop my uh, um, opening chatter here and uh, turn the mic back over to uh, Common. Great, thank you, Josh, for your opening words. Um, <laughs> there are so many questions. We actually started this conversation a bit before the event began, so we'll probably cover that some of that territory again. You know, firstly, I'd like to say that I'm probably uh, about one hundred thousand of those eight hundred thousand hits. Um, obviously, I'm exaggerating, but what you're bringing up is the enormous value of your contribution, which you, you know, could never have imagined. Many of us, you know, we read Yiddish fluently. That's not an issue. Um, but this is easily accessible and it's searchable. I don't have all the vo these volumes in hard copy. If I want to go to York, we don't have it on the shelves. If I want to go to U of T, it's not on the shelves. Um, as the local universities, it's just not there. I have to order it from the, you know, the warehouse. Someone has to bring it to me next week to take a look. You've made this at my fingertips. I don't have to hesitate to look something up. And you've taken multiple lexicons and incorporated them together. And this is fantastic. Plus, you've got all these, you've got an army of people working with you to make corrections, additions, and so on. So this is just amazing resource not to mention many people who don't have access to Yiddish. So, I mean, the first question perhaps I would ask is, why did you choose to do this? Not specifically this item, this lexicon, that you made clear, but this is not your day job. Uh, you've done other translations of Yiddish. Why did you come to working on Yiddish? Uh, and, you know, what were you imagining you were going to achieve with all these translations, what brought what brought this all about? Sort of. What were you thinking, Josh? <laughs> it is. It's, I mean, no one thought of it before, and yet now yeah. that you did it, it's so obvious that this should have been done. Um, there are probably a lot of books like that out there that that could or should be done. Um, I, as I was trying to indicate before, I uh, well, first of all. I like to translate. Not everybody, not, I mean, there are plenty of people who are capable of translating from one language to another, genuinely bilingual people and so on. I am not, but, um, but don't care to translate. They find it boring or stupid or a waste of time, or, or they would rather use their time uh, to do other things. And I understand that completely. It's just, I like to translate. Uh, you feel a kind of an immediacy with the text when you finish it that, oh, okay, it's done. Oh, it may not be right, but it's done. Um, and uh, I wanted to pick something that I thought would be valuable. Um, also, I have to admit that I find myself bored my, by my own work sometimes. And I'm always seem to be working on more than one thing at the same time, not literally at the same time, but you know what I mean? I, I'll be working on something for weeks and say, oh, God, I can't take it and pick up something else and do that. With this, I could spend a couple hours a day for, it took me about seven years. Um, and eventually work your way through the work my way through the whole thing. 
So I, um, and then, you know, as people started writing me, I said, wow, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is very interesting. I, I, I didn't mention before that people would write their messages to me in the blog uh, in Yiddish and English and French and Spanish. I even had a few people write me with, on the assumption that I could read Romanian. I only identified it as Romanian because it looked like a Romance language and I put it into Google Translate and it came out perfect. So, you know, uh, I don't know too many Romanian people, <laughs> least of all those who, you know, there are, there are more people who were born and raised in Romania in the lexicon than there are who were born and raised in Russia. But so, I mean, there are the Romanian Yiddish writers, but um, still, I, I was stunned by all that. And, and that's extremely gratifying. You know, uh, as I said, in, in, in eight lifetimes, if 100,000 people were to lift, not even read, just lift any one of my books, other books off the shelf, uh, it, it's just not going to happen. But this is, uh, you know, it's a reference work. Um, and it's, um, it hasn't been translated into any other languages either, which is interesting. I mean, English would be the natural one now that English has become such a worldwide language of uh, use. But um, I don't you know. If bring up a few, a few interesting points that I'd like to draw out. Um, firstly, this is not your only translation from Yiddish. I mean, that's worth saying something about. We'll, we'll let you say something about that. But then the other point I wanted to bring out, based on what you just said, is. This is a work of an amateur in the best sense of the word. And so many projects about Yiddish culture are the works of amateurs in oh. the best sense of the word. We wouldn't have Yiddish culture if people with little or no financial incentive who didn't worry about what critics would say or do or formal academia getting involved produced this work. I mean, the first work is Raisin's Lexicon, right? Yeah. Raman Raisin in Vilna, who is, you know, the dean, one of the deans of Yiddish scholarship, but not a professional scholar of Yiddish. No, virtually no one was at the time. Um, yeah. takes, undertakes this massive enterprise by writing letters to people, asking them to send biographical information so that he can produce, I guess, four volumes. And then by the late 20s, it becomes more volumes. He makes revisions and expands. Uh, and there are many other projects like this that we have where people just say, I'm going to do this because the culture needs it. Yeah. Uh, and they take these massive labor, undertake these massive labors of love. In fact, I don't want to get to the conversation about the claims conference and the reparations yeah. quite yet, but it's it's one of the things that Yivo tried to do and you really see come to fruition after World War II is sponsored projects uh, with academic collegiums working on this stuff. Of course, the Soviets had their own version of this, but Yiddish is, you know, yeah. Yiddish is language historically without state power. Um, in your other line of work, your, your real line of work, you yeah. work on languages with state power, Yeah. Um, right? So you know, how does this endeavor differ from what you see with Japanese and Chinese culture? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> I, and I, I'm not sure I could even answer it. I mean, State, you know, state sponsorship of, of culture is not necessarily a good thing. It certainly helps financially, but uh, it's, you know, in, in, in the case of China, we, you know, that's easy, that's obvious. In the case of Japan, depends when you look at the period you're looking at. Um, what else have I translated? Maybe we can get it to some questions. The first okay. thing, the first so you question, did the novella, right? right? What? You did Willie. Oh yeah, before that, the first thing back, I don't know, maybe 30 odd years ago, I translated a, um, a study, I, I became fascinated by uh, Shmuel Niger, the li Yiddish literary critic. Um, his name is uh, Charney was his name. Uh, he, he took the, the name, the, the pen name Shmuel uh, Niger. And he, tra he wrote a lot of interest, really interesting stuff. And this was called bilingualism uh, in the history of Jewish uh, writing. And uh, I got it and read it. And, and, and then I started reading about him. And of course, this is he, he died a long time ago, but in, in the 40s and 50s, when in the post-war period, he, he escaped being shot by the skin of his teeth and then made his way to New York and wrote for, you know, every every journal newspaper that would take him. He would write on an average day dozens of letters. And there's hundreds of these letters out there that they were writing to each other, um, which, of course, will be mostly lost now that we do most of our communication by email. But um, he was interacting with people all over the place and just a fascinating guy. 
so I, 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 this book didn't get a lot of traction. It, you know, it was published. It's still out there and it's available. Um, and then I, I translated, um, I translated Vili, which is a Willie. It's called. It's a novel. I could be. I, I love the novels of Besheva Singer's older brother, uh, Yud, Yud Singer, um, Israel Joshua Singer in English, and uh, and I was looking to see if any of his novels had not been translated, and I found this. It's a novella actually, and I ended up translating it together with um, Linda Lipsky, a, a friend and colleague here in Toronto. Um, and from there, I, I found that, and I had, I had made a Xerox copy of this decades ago and had it on my shelf, a copy of uh, his travel log that he made to the young Soviet Union, 1920-21, um, and found a translate, I found a publisher for it. And then I got a message, people might find this very interesting if you're fans of the older singer brother. I got a, a message from an, a publisher, Corn Publishers in Jerusalem, that they're planning a complete edition of uh, Yudh Yudh Zingers, uh, all of his works, and they wanted it. And so I said, yeah, sure, I don't care, publish it, publish it, that's fine. Um, so it'll come out, some, uh, we're in 2023, so it'll come out sometime this year. Um, uh, and it, it talks about his trip. He was a lefty. Um, I don't know that he was a communist, but he was a lefty. So he goes to the Soviet Union in 1920 or so, and, and, and he's a fluent speaker of Russian, but uh, he's Polish, but he's a fluent speaker of Russian, um, and of course Yiddish, and he meets all kinds of people in many different ways. And it's, it's a very, very interesting travel log. I've been interested in travel logs in another part of the world for a long time. Um, so I published that too. I, I don't know if I published anything else in, from Yiddish, but um, you know, some short pieces here and there. Um, but it's all based, like you said, in an amateurist kind of way. It's all based on a, what I find interesting. Um, I mean, even we as academics, the works that we pick are things that we find interesting. But um, those are the things that we you know, hang our career on, not, not the other stuff out there. And this this qualifies into my career like other stuff. Um, although, you know, I, I very much enjoy doing it. And, and if something crops up, I'll, I may do it again uh, with some other text. Yeah, I should mention that, uh, I mean, because I have young children and, uh, you know, what, do, what can you read and show to young children that it keeps their interest? Um, there's right. That's it. Uh, we'll you get to you get him to uh, sleep at a question night. about the child of the writers in just a moment, I think. But uh, so I show them the cartoons from Sweden and some are done better than others. Um, there's only so many of them. And there's like, you know, there's a real gap after a certain age. There's nothing available. I tried. I read stuff with them from the old Yiddish schools and, and you know, from pre-World War II and post-World War II. And, you know, it's, it's dated in many ways. It's dull. The, the, it's black and white. There aren't pictures. I you know the, the, there's the Hasidic world, which isn't, you know, necessarily appropriate for my kids. So I st went looking for Bashevis's, you know, Mansis uh, Yiddish uh, Kinder. Yeah. only to find out that they were published only in book form in English. They've never been republished in Yiddish. Uh, they've only appeared in the fall belts. Yep. So I start to dig them up. Uh, fortunately, I learned in the process um, that they are being published by the Yiddish League in New York. There's oh, a new children's edition coming out. Uh, I suspect that these stories may be still more appealing to adults than children, but, you know, there are all these hidden gems out there in terms of Yiddish literature just waiting to be brought to a larger audience, either in the original or in translation. So you have a lot more work ahead of you if you choose oh, to no. accept it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, what, what I did wanted to talk about is, well, there's a number of things. Um, let's bring this to the question of the, uh, the claims conference and the reparations. I mean, this is something I'm very interested in because of my own research. So much of Yiddish culture, this is, this is I don't know what the right word is, this is the painful irony or maybe paradox, I'm not sure the appropriate term is here. So many of the post-World War II projects in Yiddish culture rely on the claims conference on reparations money. It's the Gleister Werther Buch, which eventually accepts money. Really? It's, I didn't know. Yeah, it's, it, uh, at first they refuse. The lexicon does not. Uh, 
Yibo accepts money, Yibo and Yad Vashem projects about Holocaust research are funded by reparations money. And, you know, you could trace these debates in the press and you see that there was outrage. Um, there were the others who said we have to accept it because otherwise we won't get anything done. Yeah. And there are the ones like Melech Lavich in Montreal who said, well, let's accept the money for this. And for those writers who refuse to appeal, appear in the lexicon, let's produce a separate volume with other money. Okay. Yeah. So, and there was the other factor, and maybe you could tell me something if you know about the writers. One of the complaints that came about this is that the, right, the idea was that writers to be employed should be Holocaust survivors themselves. Hmm. Uh, and not all of them were. No, no, that's true. And there was also some complaints about that some of them were not necessarily qualified. They weren't, this was not their field. They were, you know, who, so could you tell us something about who were the people and what traces you've seen of the process and what errors crop up? And, you know, what have you, what have you learned about the process of shaping this volume, these volumes? Um, I haven't learned much because I haven't really investigated it other than what I said earlier by trying to figure out why certain people are not there. Particularly, I mean, if, if Bashevis had been in that first volume, I probably wouldn't have even, um, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have uh, arisen in my consciousness. Um, somebody said, I, mean, I, I asked some friends, who do you think is missing in volume all of base? And they said, they said, someone said, Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem. I said, no, that's under Shin. It's not under Alf. <laughs> All right. So, um, but I, I don't really know. I don't, I mean, you're right in saying that a lot of these people are famous for in other fields. They could have been scientists or, you know, uh, uh, historians of the Russian, lang uh, Russian literature or something. But um, there are sort of a lot of university positions in Yiddish studies. And there's no, and the point, the main point, which you made earlier, Kalman, is that there's no Yiddish land out there funding these projects. So um, I have to say, I, I just don't, uh, I don't have, I don't have a good feeling. I don't have a bad feeling. I don't have a, 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 a comprehensive an understanding of, of, of this. Um, and I, as I said, I don't know if, if, um, if Zach Baker's in this uh, call, but he might know some stuff and he could, if he wants to, can add something to the Q and A about this. Um, well, what you just said right now about um, people's uh, doing, I mean, I, I have to say there's something comparable. And what I want to say what you said was very interesting, but during the, um, during the period of high communism in China, many people would apply for grants from the U.S. government, which were supposed to fund, you know, were, were, they came through various defense agencies and whatnot, um, and would, would ask for money to do something and they would couch it in terms that would help us understand um, how China became communist, why China was still communist. And then they would go off and write about poetry from a thousand years ago with the money. But um, <clears throat> there may have been similar things with people applying for money from ancillary fields and then producing work in, in, the, in the Yiddish field. I just don't know enough about the historiography or the history of the field itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying stuff be that I, I know because I'm researching stuff now. Yeah. Uh, these these are stories that are yet to be told. I mean, <laughs> this is the the beginnings of you know the the story of the great encyclopedia, the great mm -hmm. Yiddish encyclopedia was Barry Trachtenberg's work was recently published, and he's coming here to Toronto in about a month to speak. Um, you know, <laughs> there are all of these. There's a whole culture that is waiting to be discovered and researched how it, these massive, you know, quasi state undertakings with German reparations money, uh, or in some cases, rejecting it to monumentalize to commemorate a culture that was in decline. But it was also a culture that was still vital to them. It was not exclusively because we need future generations to understand it, but a sense that we're still building our culture, and that every culture needs these things. You know, that's particularly one of the reasons why I was interested in, you know, with China and Japan, do, yeah. they must have something similar, of course, much better funded. Um, I, I, you reminded me just now, I, I just saw, by the way, some in, some of the people who have on the Q&A have some interesting things to say. So we will have to get to them in a minute. But when I was in graduate yeah. school back in the 70s, my advisor, um, who was a very conservative man by his own take, 
went off to South Korea, which was a military dictatorship, and accepted a ton of money from the then government. And he was vilified across the board, mostly by people to the left of center, which as you would expect at that time. It didn't matter. He brought the money back. He helped not build from the ground up, but continue to build Columbia University's Korea collection. And then within a year or two, I think it was within a year, that particular dictator was assassinated. That government fell. And Korea is now something close, much closer to a democracy um, than it had ever been. And it, and it, it has ever been. By the way, the Korean library still exists in Colombia. And so, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a di very difficult issue. Um, and I think he was very proud of himself, but uh, still, um, you're right. These are not easily, uh, which the library, easily resolved issues. And, you know, when, when Bashevis would have been approached in the early 50s, which was only a few years after the war, when he saw you know, all of Poland completely you know, turned to rubble, I can imagine that he would not have been anxious for, to, to, to see a Deutschmark anywhere. Um, yeah, no one was happy about accepting the money, clearly. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, money is money, but still, you know, as they say, money, all money is green, but um, still, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, the next question I want to ask you, I'll ask you a little bit more, and then, you know, we'll turn to the, you know, questions that have been accumulating. Um, when I was a graduate student, we used to joke, you know, what was the, uh, by, you know, what's the average uh, entry in the lexicon, you know, you know, this is, uh, I was born in the shtetl, I went to Heider at a certain age, my father died, uh, and then I encountered the Enlightenment. Yeah, um, right. And of course, they were all males, as you said. Yeah. So what I wanted to know is, you know, what have you learned about Eastern European Jewry, looking at, in a sense, this collective biography? Right. Of oh, Eastern Europe. What has struck you about the way these things are shaped, these entries, oh, uh, similarities okay. and differences, patterns? And if you have any insights into how this lexicon differs from the previous one by Raisin. I haven't looked at Raisin's much, much. Uh, his is, his is uh, if anything, packed with more errors because it was produced at a time when he, you know, he didn't have the internet. Well, these guys didn't have the internet either, but he didn't have the access to all, you know, the kinds of sources that um, the people who put together uh, this lexicon did. Um, what have I learned? My God, what have I not learned? It's all been new. I, as I said, uh, 7,100 biographies. I'm sure at least 7,000 of these people I've never heard of before. At least 6,500 of the cities in Stettlich that they were from, I've never, and, and Derflich that they were from, I've never heard of before. Um, it's, it's just amazing. Um, how uh, the world of Yiddish in the pre-war period, um, or maybe you know, the, the turn of the last century was just a, a completely different from my um, understanding. You know, I was, I'm, you know, I'm older than you, Kalman, but still I, I grew up at a time when Yiddish was, was not widely used in the United States, except in certain groups, um, the Yiddishists, which were a small group, and the Hasidim, which were a small group. But the rest of my parents spoke Yiddish, but not terribly well, and they couldn't read or write. And for us, it was, and they used it as what we call a um, crypto lect, you know, a, a language for secrets. And as because it was a crypto lect, it was cryptic, and I, it, it seemed like a joke. It was, and so we never took it terribly seriously. Um, I had my own Haskola when I finally heard it spoken uh, by people for whom it was, it was their first language. And that occurred when I was a college student, an undergraduate for you Canadians. Um, 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 but you know, for me, it was, if this is totally, I, I, I learned everything I know practically from, about, and I wish I could recall more of it than I, than I did, uh, than I do now uh, from reading these things. These, these biographies were incredibly eye-opening. There is just so much literature out there maybe spread across libraries around the world that has not uh, come to light or, you know, and there is no comprehensive bibliography as that, that I know of, of all the literature that is out there. There's just many thousands of novels and novellas, um, newspapers and journals and of short or longer 
um, runs. It, um, this is a job that's going to keep our bibliographers uh, busy for a very long time, and, and God bless them. They, <laughs> it's going to be, uh, it's going to, it's you know, if we, what we need is more students um, to to carry this field on, and uh, but you know, that's the hope that this will be a, you know, buttress to their to their uh, work. Yeah, there's there's a number of good things to say on on that front. I mean, firstly, I'm just sort of struck by the comedy of you and I, Americans, here in Canada. And of course, all the people I mentioned earlier, the major Toronto contributors to the field of Yiddish culture or Canadian yeah. contributors to the field of Yiddish culture and studies all end up in the United States or somewhere else, right? Like, like but Yiddish is by its nature a global phenomenon. So yeah. this is, you know, why shouldn't it, why should it be otherwise? Um, I, I, I should put a little plug that the U of T is having a conference called Fabindungen for graduate students about Yiddish culture. I mean, there is a, there is a thriving interest in Yiddish studies around the world that, uh, in all sorts of ways. And the internet has played a tremendous role. In fact, you were, in, you were interviewed in Ingeweb, which yes. is an online Yiddish journal run largely by graduate students. You're kind of a star amongst uh, the up and coming yeah, right. scholars of Yiddish. <laughs> I have to say, Kalman, that Kalman and I, for those of you who um, don't know, did a conference about, what is it, about, it's now 13, 14 years ago. And we had a lot of Yiddish scholars come to, um, to York University. And I was very impressed that even though many of you are not first, you know, they all spoke Yiddish to each other, even though you could easily have used English, but you all made a point of it. That was, you know, of speaking. And I, I thought that I was very impressed by that. Only a few of, of them were people were really born and raised in Yiddish. Only one or two, actually. But then you made a point of it, and that was great. Yeah, I mean, I could speak a lot about the changing of generations, but I will, I'll save that for another day. All right. Um, all right, so maybe since it's almost one, wow, that's gone fast. Let's see the questions that have accumulated so far, okay? okay. So I'm going to – I don't read very fast. So I will uh, <laughs> read these to you. Um, okay, so David Kaufman, who my, is my colleague here, who's the shift chair in Canadian Jewish studies at, at York, and you know him well, uh, asks, says, wouldn't it be amazing to use some data visualization software to show one, geographic distribution of these writers, two, the network connections among them, and three, perhaps an effort to link whatever writing by these writers is available online in any language. And he gives us a link to show us a model because that's fantastic. This sort of project could be funded by Shirk Partnership Grant. Shirk is the Canadian government uh, grant agency. York has a bunch of knowledgeable digital specialist librarians who can help. Um, this is a great idea, obviously. No. <laughs> that will take years, but uh, you're a young guy, David. You should you should launch this project, and and I'll be very supportive. <laughs> I will write a supporting letter, David. Um, it's a, it's a great idea. I but uh, again, that's one of these things. Maybe the maybe the translation of the lexicon and, um, will help to you know build a foundation to do a project like that. Uh, and now that it's online, you can trace, you know, who was from the same shuttle and who, you know, who went to the same cater and so on. And right. Going, you can, you can yeah. study cohorts. That's right. Yeah. You know, one of the things they used to joke about, and there's some validity to it, is that the Yiddish press in Warsaw was, of course, founded by Litvaks, by which they meant anybody who was from outside Congress Poland. Everybody else right. was a Litvak for them. If you didn't speak <laughs> Polish Yiddish, you were a Litvak. Um, even if you were from, you know, southern Ukraine. Um, but they also noted that the fiction writers were largely Polish Jews. Hmm. So you got, you know, someone like Sholomash or somebody else, uh, and the Litvaks did the other stuff. Okay. Uh, eventually, this, of course, changed to some extent, but that was sort of the rule of thumb for a long time in the, in the, the Yiddish press in Poland. And we could actually check this. If we, you know, and many other yeah, yeah. things, if we engage in a project like this. Sure. Yeah, so the, the opportunities with online stuff are, you know, endless. It's a little bit like a reminder of the, the, the cultural atlas of Ashkenazi Jewry. They yeah. asked for so many things, and it was, you know, it was visionary for its time. And now only with computerization are we beginning to understand the true potential of all the data that was accumulated in the language and cultural atlas of Ashkenazi Jewry in the 50s and 60s. 
Okay, so I'll go to the next. I'll go to the next comment. And once you want to add something, uh, do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? I'll read it because it makes me feel important. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, <laughs> go for it. Unfortunately, Shmuel Nigel, Shmuel Nigel, better known as oh, Charney. It's a whole controversy about what you're supposed to call him nowadays. I and know. How I know. His name in various ways, but that's a topic for another day. His bilingualism in the history of Yiddish literature, translated by Joshua Fogel, uh, 1990, is no longer available. Hand finds a copy. Is there an online copy somewhere? Not in Yiddish, I have that one, but of the translation. And that's from Suzanne Klingenstein. You know, it, it's, it's, I, I shouldn't introduce who answered these questions, I won't, but you know, these are people who really work in the field, right? This, yeah. Suzanne works in Germany. These are, you know, these are important people who have tuned in today. Uh, well, Suzanne is from Germany. I don't know that she li lives and works in Germany. She, well, she works in the U.S. I'm not sure, but she's between yeah. the U.S. and Germany. That's as far as Suzanne, I understand. Suzanne, send me an she email message herself. and I will send you a copy. Um, you're right. No, it doesn't exist online. I thought it, I thought it was available uh, for purchase, but that's very sad to know that it's not available. But send me an email message with an address, Suzanne. And that goes for nobody else, just Suzanne, okay? And I will, I will get you a copy somehow. Um, it's nice to know when you're wanted. I must say, um, and it's it is a fun book, uh, and it's an easy read. And he was an extremely erudite guy. Um, he actually wrote a book which I have, I have, but I haven't thought of translating. Or I had thought about it a lot, but I haven't done it. Um, about women readers and writers, not writers, women readers. And he wrote this in the fifties, um, which seems kind of prescient as a topic. Um, anyway. Shmuel Niger is, uh, is, there's a dissertation to be written about him. Maybe it's already been written, but um, he's a terribly interesting guy. Okay. Yeah. The next comment is by Ma Maria, whom you mentioned earlier, Maria Zabalcina. Yes. Um, Dear Professor, thanks for mentioning me. It's very flattering and inspiring, and I am the greatest admirer of your work. Very sweet. Very sweet. Thank you so much. And I see later she wrote something else. Uh, the, this question is for Kalman. You resemble the lecturer in Jewish history at Russian State University for Humanities, Project Judaica, <laughs> in Moscow 20 years ago. I have a feeling that I was among your students. Am I right? And the answer is yes. I did teach in Moscow about 20 years ago. That's absolutely right. Uh, thank you for remembering me. Good. You didn't age either. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, at least I'm recognizable. Okay. Uh, so Suzanne, <laughs> okay, I'll swim up with Suzanne and we'll move on because this is important. Okay. Uh, is there funding for Yiddish projects from the German government now? I would not think so. I think overall there is very little real interest in Germany and things Yiddish, and the level of knowledge about Yiddish and its culture outside academia is appallingly low. So she would have anything to say? She would know, yeah. Uh, that's, um, I don't know of any funding. Do you know, Common? Uh, uh, I know that Funding is an issue. I, I know. I know that much. I also know there's a there is a scholar in Scotland from Poland. Uh, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Kamusala, I think Thomas Kamusala, Tomasz Kamusala, who is written a number of articles urging the European Union to fund an institute for Yiddish. That is the duty of, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, I haven't read all the stuff, but the basic idea, I think, is that it's the duty of Europe to honor and help perpetuate this culture. Um, there's a, I could go on about this topic. There's a long history of what post-World War II Germany thinks it should be doing for Yiddish and what yeah. academics suggest to the government. That's an interesting history that needs to be written in itself. But I'm not aware of major government funding for Yiddish in Germany at this time. Okay, so Zachary, your uh, your roommate, my old buddy, yeah, and whom I'm speaking to regularly this, these days to learn about the history of of Evo in the late 20th century, has a comment or a question. Not exactly Q and A. He says one gauge for determining which authors declined to have their biographies included in the eight volumes of the Lexicon from 1956 to 81 would be to verify if the subjects of the longer bibli biographies in Bell Kagan's Lexicon from 1986 which Josh refers to as a volume nine, are included in the previous eight volumes. Um, yeah, what you can do, um, actually, Kalman asked me a similar question uh, last week, the week before. Uh, when, when it's only in Kagan, I just write at the bottom of the thing, uh, of, of the um, entry on, on the blog, I just write that 
entry. Um, but if there are other items, um, then I will say information also from Kagan. Um, so, you, I mean, so all you have to do is read all 7,100 of them and, and figure out, no, there's got to be an easier way to, to, to search for that. Um, but 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 of course that's exact that would be what 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 Zach just said is exa um, would be the the way to go. Okay, so uh, Linda Leolipsky here in Toronto uh, asks, what is the relationship of your work to Zalman Raisin's earlier lexicon? Did you have occasion to refer to it or cite it? And Yasha Kayach to both of you. I'm I'm not sure who the both of you is. One of you is certainly Josh. Uh, <laughs> Um, hi, Linda. Uh, I have used it only insofar as I checked things that I had to that were unclear. But it it seemed pretty clear from day one that the um, the lexicon, this guy, um, was a giant step forward from Raisin. Didn't Raisin just disappear at some point? I guess he no, was he's, he was killed by the Soviets. By the Soviets, yeah. His fate was unknown for some time because he was arrested. Right, that's uh, what I read. Less read. Yeah. His oh, fate was undisclosed, and eventually it was revealed that he'd been murdered. This is, you know, during the Soviet takeover of Lithuania at the beginning of World War I. Oh, so it's that early World on. War II, I'm sorry, not World, World, World War I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. World War II. Yeah. Well, that's when, okay, a lot of people, that's when, when, um, Dubnov was also executed. Just, and that's when Niger got out by the skin of his teeth. It was well, Niger gets time. out in 1919 from Vilna by the skin yeah. of his teeth. Oh, uh, okay. Raisin yeah. Snow lives until the Soviets arrive in late 39. Okay. Um, so the answer then is then that I have used it a bit, but it's it's it has been superseded in my. Est humble estimation. Although many people thought that what I and they would write me and say, "What what about this or something?" And then I would say, "Oh," you, and they would send me a, a screenshot, and it was clearly from the Raisin volume. And I said, "No, no, it's been superseded by this lexicon." And so um, I, I, I think it's safe to say that it's um, you know it's certainly valuable for the many years in between, but it um, uh, it, it, it was superseded by the the one that I translated. Okay, so Babette Albin uh, asks or says, Yiddish students at YIVO, from my personal experience as an older student with a slight exposure to the language, come from the most unlikely places, including Croatia and China. Their own ex expertise and interest was staggering. Yiddish, it seems, has become a niche trend in academia. The Israeli scholar I befriended, whose expertise was Aramaic, was convinced that the motives of state-sponsored students is suspect. Is this paranoia or justified yeah. caution? Um, maybe you can say something about this with your experience with China and the Chinese uh, government. Well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's probably a little of both, but um, I've had contact with a number of people in Japan who do Yiddish. Um, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were in, um, in Kyoto. I, I met a, uh, a woman who was involved with a Yiddish studies, Jewish studies group. And um, they had translated, and this is the first time uh, Beshevis from the Yiddish. There's a lot of translations of Beshevis from English or, um, or German or some other intermediate language. Um, but this, they had done the first ones with a collection. You know, it's a 250-page uh, book, and it's mostly stories. Um, and uh, and uh, she had done her graduate work in, in Poland and then got interested in Yiddish in that way. Uh, it, there aren't a lot of people in Japan in, or, or in China, for that matter, who uh, who teach Yiddish or teach Jewish history. There are some, but it's a, again, I, I think niche would be a nice way to put it. It's uh, it's not a uh, it would be an offshoot of <clears throat> Polish history, Jewish history to do to do Yiddish stuff. Um, I don't know about whether state-sponsored things are um, suspect in any way, maybe in some people's estimation. What do you think, Kalman? I, look, um, I have no real thoughts about this. You know, I was just, I mean, I have a lot to say, but nothing specific about that issue. Uh, I, you know, I was recently at a conference in Germany. Uh, there's an annual symposium about Yiddish studies. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one of the reasons why North Americans historically don't come that often is because they don't, the, the symposium doesn't fund your travel. 
No. You know, North American conferences, for many of them, you know, you get a grant and they fund your travel and that enables academics only have so much money to travel. But I went this year uh, in part because it was the 100th anniversary of various events in the field of Yiddish, including the introduction of Yiddish in 1922 at the University of Hamburg, where Solomon Birnbaum was the first oh, person to introduce yes. Yiddish to a Western university. So I thought it was important to go. Uh, but the, the importance of what I'm saying here is, is that there was such a wide variety of people who came from this to this conference studying Yiddish in places I had never thought of. Very often they were coming because they were already in Europe and they could make it. Yeah. Um, one of I met a young woman from Romania to whom I owe uh, a letter uh, who's doing fascinating work about Yiddish culture in interwar Romania. Um, I don't, you know, there's, I would say all work done by people in the field of Yiddish is welcome. I don't question what whose money is bringing them to these events and why their motives. They're doing fantastic work. And so much of this fantastic work is being done in Eastern Europe, in countries where people historically spoke Yiddish. And that's really to be welcomed. You know, it started off with places like Poland and Russia and then Ukraine and then Lithuania. You can see Romania fanning out over time to more and more countries. Of course, the presence of scholars from Japan and China and yeah. You and I both know Japanese scholars. I was invited with Cecile Kuznets a number of years ago to speak in Japan about Yiddish scholarship and culture. And, you know, there was a large number of people, academics, who came to see us. There was even there was a Japanese klezmer band. There's a Yiddish group in Tokyo. These, of course, you see you, these things, these things seem niche. But they're also yeah. niche here in North America. Yeah, that's true. Too, right. Yeah. So, you know, there's this wonderful. I don't, I don't know what the right word is. Fraternities. Uh, you know, community of Yiddish scholars around the world who are mutually supportive, and I welcome all of this stuff. So I think it's I think it's great. I um, you just reminded me, but recently I've been working in the field uh, on the history of the Esperanto movement in Asia, and of course the founder of Esperanto was Jewish, and Yiddish was one of his many languages, and um, through a series of connections all over the internet. I, I got in touch with a, a, a scholar at uh, in, in Paris at CNRS who works on, who is now working on knows a lot of Slavic languages and other German and so on, and uh, is now working on early dictionaries, um, Yiddish, um, Yiddish, whatever you know, Esperanto. Excuse me, Yiddish Esperanto, Esperanto Yiddish dictionaries, and so he, he taught himself Yiddish. Um, and I uh, worked, he says, every day I get, I met him in Paris this summer and uh, this past summer. And he says, every morning I get up and read Yiddish. He's not Jewish or anything, but uh, he's just, and I, I agree. And he's a great scholar. He writes me occasionally a few lines in Yiddish, but um, every little bit helps, you know. Yeah. So the next question is from Eva Puchilovska. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, anything that's had, did any, anything speak to you personally while doing this project? Have you found something that especially surprised you? Um, that's, a, that's a nice question. Thank you. Um, I have to say that 90% of what I read surprised me. Not surprised me in the sense that I never expected it to be, but it was just, it was just so interesting. And, and that kept it going. I mean, I never, I never, other than exhaustion, never flagged in my interest to, to do this. Um, so, yeah, no, I, uh, you know, there were some things that were more interesting. There are a couple of uh, these writers that found themselves in um, mostly in East Asia, in, in Harbin in East Asia. And, and that's a, a topic that's been of interest to me for many years. Um, and, but not many, you know, again, three or four at most that would find themselves that that would be part of their biography sufficient so that they would find their way into the lexicon. Um, no, I, I think just the, uh, just the enormous number of villages and cities and towns and so on that had from whence came Yiddish writers is just, uh, I mean, this may be known to people like Coleman and, and others in the field, but to me it was, it was, and again, it was not that I didn't, I, that I suspected it would not be the case, but it was still just um, something of great interest. 
Yeah, I was. I always wondered when I was, you know, reading these things years ago as a graduate student. To what extent is this a collective biography? You know, there are certain patterns and parallels you see. And to what extent are these people writing their biographies or providing information for the people who write the biographies based on a certain template? Oh, yeah. What do they think a biography should be for their generation? That would be an interesting project yeah, to see what they had in mind. I mean, they, at some point, these guys all got together. I'm just assuming they all got together in New York and said, all right, we envision this project to be you know, however long and to take however many years and how many thousands of names do we have to do and, and where are we going to get the information from? And of course, they couldn't um, type into their, their, their search engine names because this is the 1950s, right? And uh, somehow, and they had contacts all over the world. I assume they did this all in New York. Um, or at least initially did. And then they would write things, things. And when these things are going back and forth in Yiddish, and of course, there probably weren't too many Yiddish typewriters out there. So it's all handwritten stuff. There's no wonder that errors would creep in. Um, uh, and, and indeed, and, and, and with my friend in Krakow, Tomek uh, Majcik, sometimes we had to resolve that there, the, the, the place name either no longer existed, the town, or there was some sort of a typo that it somehow in, become introduced over the course of time. Uh, it, it's um, that's a whole other subject, and it's a fascinating one. What, what were the main kinds of errors that you encountered? Um, sometimes people would, um, well, dates were often, uh, but that's easy to understand. Sometimes the date was just one that was assumed, and then we learned later that you know he was arrested by the the um, KGB and well it wasn't the KGB then but you know the the, the GPU and then later executed we don't know when exactly or sometimes it would they'll simply say he was arrested and never reappeared or disappeared at that time and then later we find out the date um, long after that volume went to press those kinds of things um, would would crop up. Uh, those are the, you know, sometimes titles would be slightly wrong. Um, and Maria, who was so kind to, 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 uh, to recognize you from 20 years ago, Maria would say, no, that's not quite the right title. It's this. And that's great because now anybody, so they can look at the biography, they can see her comment. And then if they're interested enough to want to work on that person or get that book, they'll get the right title rather than, you know, look it up under the wrong title. Things like that. Those are the little things like that. Not not huge questions of whether he was right wing or left wing. I got to tell you, of the 7,100, I can only remember one person who had views that would we would now describe as to the right of center. Um, many people did not express political views, but 90 percent of them were from liberal on leftward. What, well, I'm sorry, could you elaborate? What, what are the, the most common views you find expressed amongst the entries? Uh, um, you mean political ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, whether it's somebody was a a, a, a Bundist, a, a, a communist, a social, and there were a lot of socialist parties, as you know, in Poland, and they might be affiliated with this one or that one. Um, and and of course, a lot of the squabbles between these individual leftist splinter parties were much more severe in their consequences than whether you're you know a, a German or a Russian in the middle of World War II, and 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 of course. Uh, People paid for their lives with these things. Um, so there are a lot of those kind of splinter groups. Um, uh, of course, people would be accused in the Soviet Union of being members of groups they never had any affiliation with. Of course, that's a whole other story. Um, but it was mostly those kinds of uh, lefty parties um, in Eastern Europe. Do you recall uh, encountering Orthodox writers in the lexicon? Orthodox, I mean, yeah, there are some. There are some. There are people. Because yeah, similar is a phenomenon. I just don't know how well represented it is in the lexicon. Well, what is represented is people who were born into Orthodoxy and then. Well, certainly that's many, and not most. relinquished it and became, yeah. you know, uh, communists and then oftentimes paid for that, for paid for having been born into something they had no control over. Um, uh, there were some. But, you know, as you know, Kalman, a lot of people who are uh, who are orthodox or, 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 or her, what we now call Haredi would not write fiction for the general public. Right. They might write for a, a, a niche audience, 
but that that itself is a later phenomenon. I my guess is I I'm I, not a lot, but some. Yeah, there are some in there. Yeah, um, you know, that's so. You know, we're having the the base Yaakov conference coming up soon in mm. March, and you know that's something to look talk about and look into is to what extent is Orthodox Yiddish fiction and writers represented yeah. in these projects that are really, as you say, largely the work of left wing scholars and party members post World yeah. War II. You know, I'm sure Eliezer Schindler is in there, but is you know who else is in there? Yeah. Uh, these are questions. Now, I see that I think all of the questions have been pretty much exhausted, except for one that's for me. And it's it's asking me to speak about Franz Berenik, who was a uh, Nazi scholar of Yiddish, a subject of my research, and about Birnbaum's grammar. Uh, I'll say something very briefly because it's probably not the appropriate form for this. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll just say... Uh, Kalman, can you talk a little bit about your forthcoming book? What did you find about Berenik? Uh, I found out a lot about Berenik, <laughs> which is why I wrote a book about this man who uh, was a Czech scholar uh, from Moravia, non-Jewish, who took an interest in Yiddish in the late 20s and 30s, went to Vilna, visited Yivo, and then wrote books about Yiddish, wrote a book about Yiddish, uh, for a Nazi press, or was published by a Nazi press, I should say. He tried to write it before the war, get it published by Yivo, but Yivo couldn't publish it. He published it with a Nazi press. He was a Nazi ethnic researcher, the kind of researcher who was involved in projects to reorder the, so to speak, the peoples of Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and he was disdained by most Jewish scholars after World War II, there are exceptions, who didn't believe that he was truly a Nazi or that he was guilty of anything. And the question of guilt and complicity, these are, these are sort of complicated questions that we can't get into here. But he was foundational in the field, establishing the field of Yiddish in post-World War II Germany. And now that there's a great interest in Hasidic Yiddish, which so-called Heimish Yiddish, uh, which is largely based on Hungarian communities, often the kind of Yiddish spoken in Subcarpathian Ruthenia, the eastern part of Czechoslovakia that he was particularly interested in. Anybody with a serious interest in Hasidic Yiddish today from those communities uh, has to come to Berenik's work. So, you know, he is he's hugely important for the field of Yiddish linguistics in this respect. Mm -hmm. And a very fascinating case in many other ways. Of course, just part of a much bigger... Uh, subject of German scholars who served the Third Reich during the you know, Nazi period. Uh, mm -hmm. Salman Birnbaum's grammar, we republished it uh, a few years ago in 2016. It's a revised edition of Birnbaum's grammar from 19, his book, Yiddish, uh, Yiddish to Serve in a Grammar from 1979. Is it better to have your edition than the first edition of 1914 to 1915? Um, my what I did is I took this 1979 book. I would with Salman Birnbaum's sons, David and uh, Ellie Birnbaum, who was sadly no longer with us, oh, and Jean Baumgarten in Paris. We corrected the errors. We wrote introductory essays. We extended the bibliographies. So it's a it's you know it's a Gilgulf of the 1979 book. The yeah. book that that Birnbaum published in 1918, which was the first modern Yiddish grammar. He wrote it in German. Remarkably, he was editing this while he was serving on the front in World War I for the Austro-Hungarian army and got shot while doing this. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, not shot while editing necessarily, but shot while serving. Um, that book is different. That's the beginning of his, of his career, really, in Yiddish scholarship, or at least as writing a, a, as a, you know, writing a grammar. Uh, but that's not the same thing as the 1979 book, although obviously the 79 book is an evolution from that. So the short answer is you should get all these books and study them all because they're fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Josh, are there any closing comments that you'd like to offer today? Um, well, just one brief thing I'd like to say. The, um, uh, this is not the kind of work that um, lends itself to the comment that, uh, oh, it's just untranslatable. You know, it's lost in translation. It's nothing is lost here in translation with a work like this. Um, personally, I'm of the view that 
the notion that there are no untranslatable texts. There are just lazy translators out there who don't want to, no two words between language A and language B are ever identical. I mean, they may seem very similar, you know, but, they, but they're not, not identical. And then there are conceptual terms that are difficult to translate, um, theoretical terms that are difficult to translate. Of course there are, um, but that's not the kind of thing that comes up in a work like this. Um, uh, this is, that, and that's of course what makes it easier to translate and the kind of work that lends itself to a novice, uh, an amateur, I like that word better than novice, an amateur like myself to do. Um, but I would just uh, conclude by saying that, uh, you know, if, if there are people out there who um, have a good grounding in Yiddish and, would, you know, and have time on their hands um, and interest, do it. It's, it's, uh, it's very gratifying personally and it's useful to, to others. Thanks, Josh. Um, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today, if that's the right verb we use, I don't know, in the contemporary world. This is fantastic conversation. We had people with us from around the world, and we look forward to more events in collaboration between the Toronto Committee for Yiddish and York's Kaczynski Center for Jewish Studies. So thank you, Josh, and thank you, everybody. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the day. Are you there, Coleman? Are you available, Coleman? Are you lost to me? You're gone. All right.